one of the things you'll do on a regular basis in the general chemistry laboratory is fit data to a model. You'll collect data in the laboratory and then fit it to a conceptual or quantitative model. In this video, I want to talk about this process and how to think about relating the laboratory to lecture material as well. So if we think about what goes on on the lecture side, you're introduced in the classroom to a variety of chemical concepts. These concepts are conveyed as chemical models, models of chemical theory, and we often represent these as equations. For example, PV equals NRT, or a rate law, the negative rate of change of the concentration of a reactant is proportional to that concentration, for example. But these equations are really only half of the story. There are also conceptual aspects to models and conceptual models of chemistry. And these are based primarily in what the molecules are doing at the molecular level. We can't view the molecular level directly. It's microscopic, but we can think conceptually about how molecules are behaving. And this is the basis of conceptual models in chemistry. So for example, the ideal gas model of infinitely hard billiard balls with zero volume bouncing around in perfectly elastic collisions is the conceptual basis for the ideal gas equation and the ideal gas model. And so PV equals NRT is intimately related to this conceptual model. And really, if you're the kind of person who's sort of anathema to mathematics, it's worth appreciating that equations in chemistry are often the slaves of conceptual models. So we can derive, for example, the ideal gas equation from the conceptual model of the ideal gas. This is why we try to teach conceptually. The laboratory, believe it or not, also relates to the idea of chemical models, models of chemical theory. In the laboratory, you're in there performing chemical experiments, making measurements, and what comes out of this process is a set of data and observations that end up recorded in your lab notebook. These two we can relate back to models. And so models kind of stand at the center between lecture and laboratory. Conceptual models and equations really unite the two sides of your general chemistry class. But what we do on the lab side is a little bit different. Like the chemists of old who developed conceptual models from empirical data, we're essentially going to do the same and take our data and observations and fit them to conceptual or mathematical models. Before talking in more detail about how the fitting process works, let's go way back to the basics and just think about what data is, and particularly what quantitative data is. So in the most simply designed experiment conceivable, we have two variables. Variable one, let's call that x, and let's think of that as the independent variable. And variable two, let's call that y and think of that as the dependent variable. As the independent variable, we tend to be able to control x, and so we can set it to have particular values, say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. We control the value of x. In general, we might represent the independent variable x as x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. These are the values that x takes on as we make these various measurements in the course of the experiment. While controlling and measuring x, we also measure the dependent variable, variable y, and we get measurements out of that y1, y2, y3, etc. that correspond to the x's, x1, x2, x3. The model is a theoretical prediction that relates the two variables x and y. To use the gases experiment as an example, x and y might be pressure and volume, or pressure and temperature for gas. So in general, one of the simplest types of models just uses a linear fit, meaning that y is equal to some constant m times x plus b, which is our y-intercept. This isn't the only type of model possible, but as we'll see a little bit later in the video, you can reduce a lot of more complicated models to this linear type of fit by modifying x and y. The basic process of fitting data to this model involves first plotting the data on an xy graph on Cartesian coordinates and then using the tools of statistics to come up with the parameters m and b that lead to the line that best fits the data. And the best fit essentially minimizes the distance of all of the points from the hypothetical line. So We'll use Excel to do this for us. You can use really any statistical package to do this. It's called linear regression. 
but the line you get out from this process is called the line of best fit. It's the ideal linear representation of the data. It minimizes the errors, the distance of the points from the hypothetical line. That doesn't mean it's necessarily correct. There may still be experimental errors built into the data. It's just the best theoretical prediction given the data we have. It's the most likely theoretical model given the data. Linear models come up a lot in chemistry. For example, with all other variables held constant, the pressure and temperature of a gas are linearly related. P equals mt, essentially. But there are also many other models in chemistry that are not linear. Variables may depend on one another in complicated ways. Maybe y equals x squared, or y equals the natural log of x, or y equals e to the power of negative x, or something along these lines. So we're going to need, even in general chemistry, a way to fit data to more complicated models than simple linear models. The good news is that it's possible to actually reduce more complicated models to linear models in a lot of cases. There are some complications with this, but we won't really worry about them. What we want to do really is find these idealized parameters, and we can do that through a process of linearization. You're going to hear me use this term linearization a lot throughout your general chemistry course, especially when we fit data to models that are more complicated than linear models. It essentially boils down to reducing a nonlinear model to a linear model. So let's go back to thinking about data in general. Let's imagine we had a set of independent variable values, x1, x2, x3, etc., and a set of dependent variable values, y1, y2, y3, etc. It's very often the case that y equals mx plus b is not an appropriate model to use here. We may know that for a variety of reasons. We may look at the data and suspect a nonlinear dependence. In other words, the data does not look linear when we plot y and x. We may suspect that on theoretical grounds. For example, if we were measuring pressure and volume and we suspected the ideal gas law was in play, then we really shouldn't expect those two to be linearly related, right? Because PV equals K, Boyle's law, suggests that they're inversely rather than directly related. So our motivation for suspecting a nonlinear model may be either experimental or theoretical, so to speak. And in that case, if a linear model doesn't apply, then y doesn't equal mx plus b. So that seems to leave us up a creek with respect to what we just talked about. We can't use linear regression and a line of best fit on the x's and y's themselves. But there is a solution to this problem, and the solution is to transform x and y such that we end up with a linear model. So let's see how that works. Well, imagine, again, we suspected we knew what the form of the relationship was between x and y, and we transformed the x's using some function f of x. So in other words, we started with x1, x2, x3, and we applied the function f to each of those values to generate a new set of values, f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, etc. Now imagine we did something similar to y, but using potentially a different function g. So we applied the function g to all of the dependent variable y values. So we go from y1, y2, y3, to g of y1, g of y2, and g of y3, etc. We can imagine that f and g might be linearly related to each other. So in other words, g of y may be equal to m, a constant, times f of x, plus b. This is a much more general formula than y equals mx plus b because now we're plugging in any possible functions f and g into this. So in theory then we can transform any relation between the variables x and y into a linear form just by applying the right functions f and g so that we get a constant out front of f of x and some y-intercept b. If this model turns out to be a good fit, what we've done is we've linearized the data. We've turned a nonlinear relation between x and y into one that appears linear between the functions f of x and g of y. So if we were to plot, for example, f of x on the horizontal axis and g of y on the vertical axis, we would observe a line, assuming that our model is working well. And we could now apply linear regression to this set of data f of x as the independent variable and g of y as the dependent variable to come up with a line of best fit for this. And the parameters of that best fit, m and b, are going to be associated with our linearized model. 
To close, I want to give a quick example of linearization. And as we go through this example, pay attention to how a line pops out of our transformation of the dependent and independent variables and how the parameters that we get from the linear regression of this linearized model or linearized relationship are really important and really useful. So the example I'm going to use is from thermodynamics and the theory of chemical equilibrium. The delta G for a reaction under standard conditions is related to the equilibrium constant. It's equal to negative R, the gas constant, times the temperature, times the natural log of K, the equilibrium constant. That's big K. Oftentimes, we want to measure delta G, but this is difficult to do directly. What we can measure are T, the temperature, and K, the equilibrium constant. So what we can do is measure T for a number of temperatures, say T1, T2, and T3, and measure K at those same temperatures and get K1, K2, and K3. Now given the form of this relationship, it looks complicated, right? T and the natural log of K are inversely related. Given the form of this relationship, we're not going to see a linear graph if we plot K on the y-axis and T on the x-axis. However, we can linearize this equation so that we get a y equals mx plus b type format for this. Notice that if we divide both sides by negative rt and just flip the equation to put the natural log of k on the left hand side, we get the natural log of k is equal to, and I'm going to shuffle the symbols around a little bit, negative delta g over r times 1 over t. And now we have a function in k that is linearly related to a function in t where the y-intercept is simply 0 and the slope is negative delta g over r. So what we can then do is plot the natural log of k on the vertical or dependent axis, 1 over temperature on the horizontal or independent axis, and we should expect a line. And if our data gives a line, we can do linear regression, look at the slope of that line. The slope of that line times negative r is going to be equal to the free energy change of the reaction. So in this case, linearization was essential for us to fit this data to an equation that we could then easily pull the delta g out of.